Hey everyone, it's Sam. I am here again from the marketing department with NATP. Um, you might notice I have a very special guest with me today. Um, I am joined by Jan, who is one of our tax content specialists. Jan has been with NATP for about four years, just a little under. Um, and Jan, we are going to talk today about our well, about a blog that you that you recently wrote, um, but specifically about um, stimulus questions, stimulus check questions, excuse me. Um, but before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Sam, for that great introduction. Like you said, I am a tax content specialist, and I have been with NATP for almost four years. Um, I recently moved into the position of a tax content specialist. And prior to that, I was a tax researcher, and then I was a tax research specialist, and like we just said, now a tax content specialist. So you're um, a pro. I'm still learning. <laughs> yep, so I'm a pro. Uh, <laughs> I'm still learning everything that's expected um, with of me in this new role. Um, but like you had mentioned, one of my favorite tasks is the blog. We've been working together on the blog. Um, and the intent of that is to educate tax professionals. And I am enjoying doing uh, tasks such as this. Yeah, well, it's, it's nice to have you, Jan. Um, you have an abundance of knowledge, and so we're excited to be able to share that with everyone who's watching and who um, is checking out our blog specifically. So today, like I said, we're gonna be talking about stimulus checks um, and this is one of the biggest topics that people are talking about this year. Otherwise, the stimulus checks, otherwise known as economic impact payments. Um, I believe there were a few other names floating around, but when we say stimulus checks, we're talking about the checks or the funds that were deposited to a certain group of eligible taxpayers um, who fall into a thir certain threshold in income threshold can't talk today goodness um <laughs> so what is, is there anything that you would add to that definition of the stimulus checks and then follow up what are some of the biggest issues surrounding these payments good question um yeah like you had mentioned the stimulus checks go by a, a variety of names i mean we've seen like eip1 eip2 um but for most purposes, you know, stimulus payments, stimulus checks um, is the most common name. Um, and like you mentioned, most most eligible taxpayers would have received uh, hopefully a, a payment by now, uh, either by a paper check, direct deposit. Some have also received an EIP debit card. Mm -hmm. um, these payments were there were two payments, if you will recall. There was the first, first, first round of payments in the beginning of the year, probably around April, May, and then the latest round, you know, early, early January. Yep. Um, the, most people, I, well, I shouldn't say most people. A lot of people have received direct deposits, mm -hmm. um, and they went into um, valid, you know, bank account information, and then if you did not either have a valid bank account, the IRS mailed those payments um, via a paper check or an EIP debit card. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously paper checks take more time than the direct deposit. Mm -hmm. and, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. And then um, some people are still having issues with either the first payment or the second payment. Um, but the good news there is if they're having issues, it can all be reconciled on the tax return. Awesome. And so um, speaking of, of issues specifically with these funds, some of the common reasons, or what are some of the common reasons that, that people either received an incorrect amount or they didn't receive it at all? Um, I know that you guys in, in our research team have been getting some questions about that specifically. Um, yep, and that's a very good good question. Um, there are a number of reasons why uh, an incorrect amount of payment could have been received. Like for example, 
The payments, if you'll recall, were based either on the 18 or 19 return, depending on which tax return was filed. Mm -hmm. So if your income in 2020 dropped from either, say, 18 or 19, um, you're now due do more money because mm -hmm. your your payments were based on a higher higher income level than you're currently currently receiving. Mm -hmm. um, also, another example would be if somebody claimed you as a dependent on the 19 return, but now you're independent. So now you would be eligible for the stimulus payment. Mm -hmm. um, there are issues with um, having a child. So if somebody had a child. Um, after the 19 return was filed. Um, so for example, in 2020, you had a child, you're now due additional monies for that. Um, if you never filed a tax return, um, that would be a, a common reason. Mm -hmm. uh, change in filing status um, and possibly uh, being deceased. Okay, so are you and our team, are, are we expecting to see a lot of questions for tax pros from their clients on, on these payments this year specifically? Yeah, I mean, I would expect so um, because what happens is the payments that were received and the payment that should have been received uh, is all gonna have to be reconciled on the tax return. So for 2020, there's a new line on the tax return. It's actually on the second page, uh, line 30. It's um, a rebate recovery rebate credit and the tax professional is going to have to reconcile the re recovery rebate credit that's due to the taxpayer with the amount that the taxpayer actually received. So mm -hmm. once that reconciliation is done, if the taxpayer is owed money, uh, good news is they will, that, that will all be reconciled in the tax return. So they can get that money back or they can get that money. Uh, and also the good news is if after the reconciliation, it was discovered that you received too much money, uh, you don't have to pay that back and it's not income to That's the exciting. taxpayer. That's exciting for, for the clients who will be receiving that news if they, if they do. Um, and just a quick, I want to, I want to cover this too. So, um, we've been talking about as, as a tax preparer, you need to do your due diligence, um, make sure that all of the information that you have is correct. Um, and so taxpayers received letters from the IRS with the amount um, that they were paid. A lot of people probably didn't keep those um, for whatever reason. Maybe they didn't know that they were supposed to, um, you know, what what would you recommend a tax pro like what steps can the tax pro take to make sure that they are doing their due diligence to make sure these funds are accurate that they're reporting okay um another good question <laughs> <laughs> you're just full of them today um <laughs> so with the first round of stimulus the taxpayers um, should have received a notice 1444 and like you said a lot of people didn't keep it, didn't realize that they needed to keep it, uh, and for whatever reason, tossed it. Mm -hmm. um, with the second round of stimulus payments, um, the IRS will be mailing out another notice. It's going to be 1444B. Um, as of today, those, the, according to the IRS's website, those notices have not, have not gone out yet. So if uh, your client has not kept either notices or you're filing a tax return before they get the second notice, there's a number of things that you can do um, because like we had talked about, you're going to have to reconcile that. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing you could do is if your client has a tax account, and this is all on the IRS's website. So if your client has a uh, tax account, they could log into that tax account and print the notice or an account transcript. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, or if your client does not have a tax account, you can help them create one. Uh, just keep in mind, it may be time consuming to assist your client because uh, according to the IRS, people are having a hard time setting that up due to the authentication uh, processes in place. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one option. Another option, um, is using the get my payment tool on the IRS's website. 
that unfortunately will not tell you everything that you need. Um, it will confirm that the IRS sent, say the first payment and the second payment and how it was sent, for example, direct deposit. And then it will give you the last four of the bank account information. Uh, but then as a tax professional, you're somehow going to have to reconcile that with the actual amount that was received because like I just mentioned, it's just confirming that a payment was there. So you're still not gonna know how much was received. So you're probably gonna have to get back with your client and ask for a copy of a bank account, mm -hmm. uh, something like that to confirm. Mm -hmm. And then if those two options don't work, the last uh, option that you could possibly try is obtaining a account transcript for your client. Mm -hmm. um, to use this option, uh, you would need to have an e-services account and the transcript will, will have codes on it that refers to the, the tax credit and the refund amount that was issued. So um, I guess in a nutshell, there's a number of ways that you can work through it. Um, some are more user friendly, I guess, than others, mm -hmm. um, but right. let's just hope people kept those notices or can easily tell you. Otherwise, you are going to have to probably invest some time and energy in getting the proper amounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great information. Thanks for sharing that, Jan. Um, yep. So to kind of wrap things up today, we thought it might be fun to go through a few common scenarios that, that have occurred that we know of um, with the stimulus checks. So the first one, um, Jan, is what happens if either of the stimulus checks or the EIPs um, were sent to a deceased person? Okay. Um, well, if you will recall, there's there were two stimulus ones, like we had talked about. The first one, uh, first part of the year, and uh, the last one, you know, roughly first part of January. Um, on the IRS's website, they have a list of FAQs. Um, FAQs stands for Frequently Asked Questions um, that are somewhat helpful. Um, regarding, in the case of a deceased person, regarding the succulent stimulus, second stimulus check, um, the IRS is saying that if someone died after January 1st, 2020, they are eligible for the stimulus. So in the FAQ, um, for the second stimulus, it's saying the, a payment won't be issued to someone who died before January 1st, 2020. So if you file a joint return uh, with your spouse and they died before you know January 1st, say sometime in 2019, mm -hmm. you won't receive that $600 for that individual. Um, but you would still receive it for yourself and your children, if applicable. Um, so regarding the second, the first stimulus, um, there's an FAQ that's saying if somebody dies before receiving the payment, it should be returned to the IRS. Um, so if somebody, say, died March 1st and the first stimulus was received April 1st, that payment should be returned. Um, there's some guidance out there that says some of those checks were also canceled. Uh, so I guess it just depends on what happened. Um, so big picture, based on the FAQs, it would seem that somebody who died in 2020 would be eligible for the second stimulus payment of the $600. But if you died in 2020 before receiving the first stimulus, you would not be eligible. Whether or not that will change, I don't know, because like I said, it's based on the FAQs out there. Got it. So another um, fun topic. So what if someone had a life-changing event occur between the two stimulus payments? So, you know, they had a baby, all of the, all of the COVID babies um, everyone's talking about, or, you know, maybe they adopted a child. Um, there's some sort of qualifying child that came into the mix between the two payments. How does that affect things? Um, that's another good question. Um, so the scenario you're talking about would be, for example, if somebody had a baby in 2020, mm -hmm. 
Um, so let's say you have a married couple, they have a child, you know, sometime in, in 2020. Uh, like we mentioned, the stimulus payments were based on the 2019 return. So obviously that baby wouldn't have been on the 19 return. Now you're filing the 2020 return. Um, that couple could possibly, depending on where their income lies, um, receive up to you know $1,100 in extra stimulus money, 500 from the first round and 600 from the second round. Uh, so if a child was born between you know January 1st and December 31st, uh, the couple could get an additional $1,100. Um, and then, like we were discussing about earlier, that would all be reconciled on the tax return. So you would have to find out how much the parents received, um, do the math, and then possibly they would be eligible for the $1,100. Sorry, I had to put myself on mute. We had some barking dogs here. Enjoy the, <laughs> of going live from home. Um, that's, that's really great information, Jan. Thanks. So the last question, um, less hypothetical situation. So what if someone, this is probably a pretty common situation um, for a lot of people, their income increased in 2020 from the prior year. So 2019, they made a certain amount. 2020, their income increased. Um, what, what happens? Does the person need to pay back the advance payments? Um, talk us through that. Okay. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, and it, I mean, it could happen because there are industries right now that are, you know, thriving under COVID, um, you know, construction, for example. So, you know, for example, let's say you have a taxpayer, you know, we'll call him Grant, who maybe received an $850 stimulus based on his 2019 tax return. Now he's coming to you and you're reconciling the credit on his 2020 return and you discover that he was only entitled to $650. So he received 850, he's entitled to 650. Um, he received $200 more than he should have received. Well, the great news is that $200 is not income to him and he does not need to pay that back. Um, but let's say the flip happened and let's say Grant Grant's income decreased from 2019 to 2020. So based on the 2019 income, he received, you know, $650. But when you were doing all the reconciliation, he should have received $850. Uh, the difference of $200 would be due to him. So when the practitioner files the tax return um, on line 30, you would have that $200. That's good news. Yep. Good news. So, I mean, unfortunately, you know, as practitioners, we're going to have to be asking a lot more questions than we normally do mm -hmm. um, to reconcile. And it's probably going to take more time to do the returns this year. Mm -hmm. So, Jan, as we wrap things up, is there anything else that you think people should know or that you want to add about, you know, these academic impact payments? Um, I would just, you know, maybe stress trying to get those notices, you know, that first notice, the 1444 or the notice, the second notice when it comes out, the 1444B, uh, because it really, that's your starting point. Without without those, you're going to have a hard time reconciling all this. Um, and hopefully your clients can provide some input. Otherwise, they may do some, they may need to do some legwork. You may do, need, need to do some legwork. Um, and between the two of you, you, you guys can kind of figure it out. This is great. This has been really helpful, Jan. I know that um, these have been questions on everyone's mind. So thank you for joining me and, and helping to address these. I appreciate you and your time. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. Good. So for those of you who are looking to learn a little bit more about the economic impact payments, um, read a little bit more in detail about what Jan wrote about in her in a, in a recent blog. Um, you can check out that blog and many more at blog.natptax.com. We do update it regularly um, and, and have quite a bit of relevant content that you and, you know, all of your, your coworkers, if you're in an office, um, 
would probably find interesting. So make sure to check that out. Um, as always, say, we hope you stay safe and healthy. And we will see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.